Praise the Lord and pass the ammunition. It's time for the Gun Guy TV podcast. Hi, this is Joel Persinger. I'm the Gun Guy. Thank you very much for listening to the Gun Guy TV Firearms Podcast and supporting me the way you do. I appreciate the fact that you watch my videos as well, if you do that on YouTube and one of the other, perhaps, I don't know, there's so many places you can watch them now. By the way, this podcast is an hour long, the first half an hour of which is syndicated on your favorite podcast player. So you'll find it on Stitcher, Spotify, iTunes which is now Apple Podcast, Google Podcast, iHeart, and a whole bunch of other places. And it is growing like crazy. So I'm very, very grateful for all of your support. Please don't stop. All right, now look, a few things that I've been thinking about lately and I've been doing some reading on, which you might find interesting, is the idea that things just don't change much over time. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. Now, okay, why do I bring that up? Because I've been looking at old training. It's fascinating to me as I look at the training that soldiers were given and police officers were given a long time ago, and I see the training that we do now for shooting and self-defense and fighting. They really haven't changed all that much. Now, I've been involved in the martial arts for a long, long time. I've So far, I've practiced and studied three different martial arts. I started out with Tang Soo Do and then did a little Taekwondo, and then some Chinese martial arts, some internal Chinese martial arts. Those are Xingyi, Bagua, and Taiji. And I didn't get too far in those. I spent a few years on it, but uh, not too far. And then the Filipino martial arts for quite some years. And in doing that, what I've discovered is that we all have the same two feet and the same two arms. I mean, unless you're missing a limb, everybody's only got two legs and two arms. And our bodies are similar. The places we would strike or the places we would attack are always the same ones. And so what you discover is that each system has its own way of doing that. But what it devolves down to in a fight typically is punch, kick, grab, throw, or choke. And so the bottom line is that although there are different ways to punch someone, kick someone, strike someone, throw someone, grab someone, twist someone, lock someone's joints or whatever, or choke someone, It really boils down to just a few that actually work. And so in those kinds of contests, if they're actually contests on the street, not so much the uh, the type of contest that you would see in a competitive fight, like a cage fight or something, but what happens on the street really boils down to the person who reaches devastating violence first. Now, an old instructor of mine used to say the first person who reaches finishing violence first wins, which if you want me to explain that comes down to the person who is able to effect some finishing technique on the opponent fastest wins. Now, that could be a devastating punch, which knocks that person over or knocks them down, a devastating kick, a devastating strike with some object, a devastating choke, a devastating throw, but it all kind of comes down to the same stuff. And each one of those martial arts will tell you that theirs is the best. And that theirs is the only way to do what it is you're trying to do. And nevertheless, when you look at the way each one of them will fight when it comes right down to it, they all look pretty similar, don't they? Well, along those lines, I've been looking back at some old books that I have. One of my dad's favorite books, I think I may have mentioned to you before that my dad was a deputy sheriff for quite some time. And one of his favorite books is one written by Bill Jordan called No Second Place Winner. I have a copy of it actually right here in my hand, and I do like the book a lot. It has a lot of similarities with other books I've read. One of my favorite books is one called Kill or Get Killed by Rex Applegate, because it covers things other than, I have that in my hand too, by the way, and you can probably hear the pages go in the background. And that one's pretty dog-eared because I've gone through it a lot. I've found in that one that the combative things that they taught in that book, that Rex Applegate taught, are not terribly dissimilar from what is taught today. Now, there have been some newer techniques come along. There have been, I guess you might say there's been some perfection of certain techniques, or perfection is probably too perfect a word. Maybe I should say some improvement upon techniques. And then, of course, there are some things they just don't teach anymore because politically they're not correct or legally they're not acceptable or whatever the case might be, even though they may well have worked extraordinarily well at the time. 
Well, that is also true when you go even further back and you look at a book written by W.E. Fairbairn and Eric Sykes called Shooting to Live. Now, this is an old book that was written a long time ago, and actually the preface or preface, or however you want to say that, in the book was written by Colonel Rex Applegate, who in his young time as a, as a young lieutenant in the military was a student, if you will, of both Fairbairn and Sykes. And so a lot of the techniques that they talk about actually end up in his book. Here's some, uh, just a couple of brief passages from Shooting to Live, which I think you might find interesting. It's actually in The Purpose of the Pistol is the chapter. I've read this book and scoured it and noted things all over the place. But these things I find interesting because I think they really do point to our, well, okay, before I even read them, let me, <laughs> let me point that out. In case you haven't noticed, there's always a new widget that you have to buy or a new doohickey you have to buy or the latest and greatest optic or the latest and greatest sights or the latest and greatest trigger or the latest and greatest way to do this, that, and the other thing. Have you ever noticed that? Where guns are concerned, there's always some tactical this or tactical that, something that you can't possibly live without in order to get the job done. Well, when these folks wrote these books, there were no special sights. There, were no, there was no technology to work with. And yet they had to fight effectively in the dark, in weird terrain, in oddball places, from oddball positions. These are all the things that they had to figure out before there were all these technological advantages. There was no laser sight that they could use. There was no illuminated optic that they could use. There was none of that stuff. They just had to get the gun to work without sights at night or without sights in the dark. They had to figure out how to hit the bad guy so that the bad guy didn't get them. What's the old rule? Hit him and don't let him hit you. Now that applies to hands, feet, clubs, and bullets. Hit him, <laughs> don't let him hit you. So let me read to you a couple of little passages here that I find very interesting, which is, an, you know, it was written by a couple of Brits, and so it's written a little differently than American English, and uh, it was written quite some time ago, so a little bit more polite, perhaps. But I think what you'll discover is that their teaching is not terribly dissimilar from what is taught today. So let me start off with something I'm sure is going to tweak somebody's beak, because I've been teaching this for a long, long time, and it's nice to read both Fairbairn and Sykes write it into a book. Here's what it says. Target shooting has its place, and we have no quarrel with it. There probably will be a quarrel, however. When we go on to say that beyond helping to teach care and the handling of firearms, target shooting is of no value whatever in learning to use the pistol as a weapon of combat. Now, before I even go any further, let me make sure that I'm, I clarify something. I'm not a veteran. I've never been in combat. I have never killed another human being, and I hope that I never do. So, what I'm sharing with you is not from my experience. It's from the experience of these guys who, between the two of them, just in the Shanghai Police Department, were involved in over 200 armed confrontations and later helped train the OSS, which was the forerunner, I think, of the CIA in the American military and trained military and police until the days that they both retired and uh, at some subsequent time passed away. So let me go back and read that again and then give you a little bit more of the quote. Beyond helping to teach care and the handling of firearms, target shooting is of no value whatever in learning to use the pistol as a weapon of combat. The two things are as different from each other as chalk from cheese. And what has been learned from target shooting is best unlearned if proficiency is desired in the use of the pistol under actual fighting conditions. I'm absolutely positive that somebody's going to get upset about that statement. They're going to tell me, well, flash sight picture or whatever, you know, this particular technique or that particular technique. You know, it's not accurate if you don't use your sights and whatever. Well, I will take you out and demonstrate to you how instinctive shooting works and point shooting works with a handgun at close proximity, and you'll find out you don't need sights at all. When the distances we're talking about are so short that you could literally take the ammunition out of the gun and throw it, beaning it off the forehead of your opponent, then you do not need sights in order to hit him. 
these contests happen statistically, not because I've experienced them, I haven't, but if, I, if you read the statistics, you learn that these particular contests between armed citizens, police officers, security officers, or whatever, and criminals are generally at very close proximity and happen over a very short period of time. This is what Fairbairn and Sykes were trying to address in Shanghai. I'll read a little bit more on what they discovered and what they did in just a minute. I've mentioned to you many times that this podcast could not happen without your support. So I urge you to support us one way or the other. And one easy way to do it would be to use our Amazon link when you shop Amazon. Nothing changes for you. Everything works exactly the same. And using our Amazon link does not cost you one red cent. All you have to do is go to gunguy.tv and click on the Amazon banner at the top, then bookmark that link. Every time you go back to that bookmark and shop Amazon, no matter what you buy, we'll get a little commission. It won't cost you a thing. So help us out here at Gun Guy TV by using our Amazon link. You're listening to the Gun Guy TV podcast. Please pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Getting back to the book to confirm what I was sharing with you, again, you have to understand that these two men with, that wrote this book had been involved in shootout after shootout after shootout after shootout, well over 200 of them. So when they wrote this book, they, they could speak with some authority as to what actually happens in that kind of shooting context when you're fighting for your life. The book goes on to say, in the great majority of shooting a phrase, the distance at which firing takes place is not more than four yards. Very frequently, it is considerably less. Often, the only warning of what is about to take place is a suspicious movement of an opponent's hand. Again, your opponent is quite likely to be on the move. It may happen, too, that you may have been running in order to overtake him if you're a police officer. If you have had reason to believe that shooting is likely, you will be keyed up to the highest pitch and will be grasping your pistol with an almost convulsive force. If you have to fire, your instinct will be to do so as quickly as possible, and you will probably do it with a bent arm, possibly even from the level of the hip. The whole affair may take place in a bad light, or none at all. And that is precisely the moment when the policeman, at any rate, is most likely to meet trouble, since darkness favors the activities of the criminal. Well, I will stop there and say that's most likely where most of us are going to meet trouble because darkness tends to favor the criminal. I'll also point out to you that statistically, from what I can determine, it's quite common for citizens today to defend themselves with a handgun one-handed rather than firing with two hands. So we go back to that target shooting thing. We go to the range. What do we practice all the time? two-handed shooting. I have students all the time who I will I'll take them through a qual, uh, some sort of qualification, whether that's as a security officer or for their concealed carry permit here in California or whatever, where they have to fire just a few rounds, one-handed, with either hand, and they struggle dramatically to do it. And yet, it is not particularly without note that sometimes people will shoot one-handed simply because they don't want to drop their latte or they don't want to drop their phone. They've taught themselves not to drop the phone for fear of cracking the screen. And so we do in the instant when we need to fight for our lives precisely what we do every day. We'll hang on to that phone with a death grip and fire one-handed. Likewise, it's not particularly uncommon for a person who's defending themselves standing next to a loved one to take their support hand and use it to push that loved one out of the way, which leaves them only one hand with which to fight. And yet we don't practice that skill. I'm going to tell you that we should, because as these two gentlemen so eloquently said, target shooting and shooting to save your life are as different as chalk and cheese. Now he goes on to write, it may be that a bullet whizzes past your head and that you will experience the momentary stupefaction, which is due to the shock of the explosion at very short range of the shot just fired by your opponent. A very different feeling, we can assure you, from that experienced when you are standing behind or alongside a pistol that is being fired. Finally, you may find that you have to shoot from some awkward position, not necessarily even while on your feet. There is no exaggeration in this analysis of fighting conditions. Here we have a set of circumstances which in every respect are absolutely different from those encountered in target shooting. Do they not call for absolutely different methods of training? To answer this question, we must consider the essential points which emerge from our analysis. They appear to be three in number, 
and we should set them out in the following order. 1. Extreme speed, both in drawing and firing. 2. Instinctive, as opposed to deliberate aim. 3. Practice under circumstances which approximate as nearly as possible to actual fighting conditions. Well, now I have to ask myself the question, and I'll ask you too. Number one, extreme speed, both in drawing and firing. How often do you practice that? If you carry a gun every day, like I do, how often do you, and, or, or for that matter, do you at all ever practice drawing your firearm and getting it on target? Have you ever had an opportunity to practice that? Do you practice it in dry practice so that when you practice it with live ammunition, you don't shoot yourself in the foot? If you've never practiced that in any form, any way, then you're not going to be able to draw that firearm quickly, and you're not going to be able to get it on target quickly when you have to. That's not going to be so good for you, maybe. You might be fortunate and be okay, but far better to practice that skill. You'll take a class with somebody that can teach you that skill and practice it a lot dry before you ever put ammunition in the gun so that you don't injure yourself doing it. Number two, instinctive as opposed to deliberate aim. Now, when I was coming up, they used to call that point shooting, and my dad was quite the aficionado of point shooting because, as I said, for example, he was a fan of the book No Second Place Winner by Bill Jordan, and he also liked Kill or Get Killed by Rex Applegate. This is how I knew about these books in the first place. He also took classes on point shooting and taught me when I was growing up. So point shooting is a very effective skill at very close quarters, and yet we don't hear about it very much anymore because it fell out of favor and uh, what replaced it was flash sight picture. Well, I'm going to tell you that at distances of three feet, four feet, five feet, point shooting is faster, more effective, and more likely to occur because people will do exactly what these gentlemen are saying they're going to do. They will focus on the threat rather than on the sights, post a gun out there, or push it out there, and start pressing the trigger. We see police officers do it all the time, and they miss 70 or 80% of the time, because it's not a skill that they practice. It's a skill that has to be practiced like any other skill. It's perishable. And if it isn't practiced, it won't be done. So something to practice, instinctive shooting, or what we used to call point shooting. Number three, practice under circumstances which approximate as nearly as possible the actual fighting conditions, which means you might want to see if you can find a place where you can practice in twilight or where you can practice in the dark, where maybe go take a low light class where you have to use a flashlight or where you have to fire on targets when the light is very dim or that you don't, where you don't have any at all and where you get to fire one handed. There are still people teaching this stuff. I encourage you to take a class so that you know what to practice and how to practice. The book goes on to say, in commenting on the first essential, let us say that the necessity for speed is vital and can never be sufficiently emphasized. The average shooting affray is a matter of split seconds. If you take much longer than a third of a second to fire your first shot, you will not be the one to tell the newspapers about it. It is literally a matter of the quick and the dead. Take your choice. Unquote. These guys in this book did not pull any punches at all. They went right after it. I'm going to read a little bit more from this book, just a tad more. We'll talk about what they were teaching and how well it worked out for them in just a minute. And then in the second half of the podcast, I'd like to talk a little bit about how this applies to long guns, shotguns, and rifles. It's a little different, but the techniques are outstanding. Stick around. I'll get to that in just a minute. I want to thank you for listening to my podcast and paying any attention to what I have to say at all. I really do appreciate it. After all, I'm nobody special. I'm just a working stiff with a, with a podcast and a YouTube channel and a love for shooting and a desire to teach and a love for teaching shooting. That's all I am. I'm not uh, a special ops guy or a SWAT guy or any of that kind of stuff. There's a lot of those guys around. I certainly am not one, but I do very deeply appreciate the fact that you listen and watch and that you support Gun Guy TV. I urge you to check out Patreon as well. If you would like to get the exclusive content that I produce and provide there, there's quite a bit of it. And it can only be found on Patreon, including the second half of this podcast, which is only available on Patreon. So you might check it out. You'll find the link to Patreon and our particular page on Patreon on our website at gunguy.tv. Shooting straight and always right on target. This is the Gun Guy TV podcast.
one thing I learned from my dad growing up is that at close quarters, aiming is not the type of aiming we would normally use. When we think of aiming a handgun, for example, we typically think of lining up the front sight with the back sight, which gives us a good sight alignment, and then placing that on the target, which gives us a great sight picture, and then being very scrupulous about our breathing and our position and our trigger press, making it nice and smooth, and we'll drill a hole right in the middle. To this day, I can, with most handguns, if I take my time, I can write my name on the target. Now, it's not going to be beautiful, and it's not going to be, it's going to be in printing, thank you. I'm not going to use any kind of script, and I'm not going to write my last name. It's too long, but I can write J-O-E-L on the target. I've done it many times for people. It just takes me a while, but that's because I'm target shooting, and I'm trying to be extraordinarily accurate, and I'm taking my time, and I'm applying all the fundamentals of shooting in order to do that. Well, many of those fundamentals need to be sped up a lot, and some of them can't be used at all when you're defending yourself. For example, you're not likely to be in the perfect shooting stance. You may not have the perfect shooting grip. You might not have any of this stuff. You're not going to be uh, watching your breathing because you're going to be huffing and puffing full of adrenaline. All that stuff goes down to tubes. Now, trigger press is very important. But aligning the pistol against the target so that you can actually hit it involves more instinct than it does actual traditional aiming. And they go into that in the book. Again, it says, and this is a quote, Instinctive aiming, the second essential, is an entirely logical consequence of the extreme speed to which we attach so much importance. That is so for the simple reason that there is no time for any of the customary aids to accuracy. If reliance on those aids has become habitual, so much the worse for you if you are shooting to live. There is no time, for instance, to put yourself into some special stance or to align the sights of the pistol, and any attempt to do so places you at the mercy of a quicker opponent. In any case, the sights would be of very little use if the light were bad, And none at all if it were dark, as might easily happen. Would it not be wiser, therefore, to face facts squarely and to set to work to find out how best to develop instinctive aiming to the point of getting results under combat conditions? To which you might say, yes, but I have night sights on my pistol. Yes, but I have an illuminated optic on my pistol. Yes, but I have a nice little micro red dot on my pistol. Yeah, okay, well, what happens when the batteries die or the night sights, uh, the tritium in the night sights starts to fade? or whatever, or, 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 or. If we're dependent upon the technology, then when we don't have the technology, we're screwed. That's the way it is. So I I look back at these old techniques and I think, gosh, darn it, these folks didn't have technology. And yet, you know what? They were able to fight wars effectively. They did a lot of things effectively because they learned how to use what they had and do it in the best possible way, given whatever they were working with and the limitations of the tools they had. I love the idea of going back and learning those skills so that If I find myself with a limited tool where I don't have night sights or night vision or or lasers or whatever, I can still operate the gun in such a way that I can keep myself alive and I can defeat my enemy. It can be done. It's not terribly difficult. I've been doing point shooting for a long time, and uh, they explain point shooting in this book brilliantly, so let me read you that little portion, and then we'll discuss this a little bit more. We'll start talking about long guns. But I urge you to pick up this book. It's called Shooting to Live. W.E. Fairbairn and Eric Sykes is still available. Um, Let's see who's printed. It's Paladin Press prints it, and it is an absolutely great read. Uh, Let's go on here. Everyone is familiar with the fact that he can point his finger accurately at an object at which he happens to be looking. It is just as easy, moreover, to do so without raising the hand so high as to the level of the eyes. The book goes on to challenge you a little bit. Please try this little experiment while sitting at your desk. Sitting squarely and keeping both eyes open, raise your hand from the level of the desk, but not so high as the level of your eyes, and with a straight arm, point your extended forefinger at a mark directly in front of you or on the opposite wall. Observe carefully now what has taken place. Your forefinger, as intended, will be pointing to the mark which you are facing squarely, and the back of your hand will be vertical, as it would be if you actually held a pistol. You will observe also that you have brought your arm across you until your hand is approximately in alignment with the vertical center of your body, and that under the directing impulse of the master eye, your hand will be bent from the wrist towards the right. 
The elements of that little experiment form the basis of the training system, which is elaborated in succeeding chapters. We cannot claim that the system produces nail-driving marksmanship, but that is not what we're looking for. We want the ability to hit with extreme speed man-sized targets at very short ranges under the difficult circumstances we have outlined already. Nail-driving marksmanship will not cope with such conditions. This is an astounding little book. I think the thing that gets me the most when I read it, and I do go back and read it again every few, few years. I, I've had it for quite some time. This is getting to be a dog kind of beat-up copy. But the thing is, you just discover that this old stuff works. It worked back then. It works today. And frankly, it's not terribly dissimilar from what is taught by leading training schools at this moment in the 21st century. This was developed in the early part of the 20th century and late part of the 19th century. That's how old this stuff is. And it was used in wars by police departments adopted all over the place until newer or perhaps trendier techniques were adopted. And trust me, there's a lot of trendy techniques out there. I don't know that trendy is necessarily the best. Sometimes the old ways teach us things that we won't learn from the new ways. So it might be worth exploring this book. Let me give you the three books again. Shooting to Live, this is by W.E. Fairbairn and Eric Sykes. It's a little book, uh, but it's a great one. And I mean, they sell them for next to nothing, for crying out loud. You probably could get it on half.com or whatever. I will put it up on our website so that you can get it from the Gun Guy TV store if you like. I'll make sure it's there if I can find it for you. And I'll, I'll try to do that before I publish the, the, uh, the podcast. You can go to gunguy.tv and you'll be able to find it there. In fact, if I can do that, I'll put a link to it in the description so you can find it. There's also Kill or Get Killed which is an excellent book, which covers a lot of stuff by Rex Applegate, who was not surprisingly a student of W.E. Fairbairn and Eric Sykes. And then my dad's, one of my dad's favorite books, which I absolutely love as well, is by Bill Jordan, who was a champion pistol shooter, a fast draw guy, and a very well-known, almost, I suppose, hall of fame, if you will, border patrol agent and border patrol supervisor. And he wrote that book, Bill Jordan, No Second Place Winners. My dad was a policeman, was a deputy sheriff back in Jordan's day. And he was looked at as quite the authority in police work and the use of the gun as a police officer. So my dad really liked that book and respected Mr. Jordan a lot. So I've been reading that book for years. And, and there's a lot of it that really does apply today, particularly if you are considering defending yourself with a handgun or you're considering carrying a handgun, and that's what you're going to do. You want to really get into some of this older stuff because, for civilians at least, we're not walking around with all kinds of body armor. We're not lock, walking around technology to death a lot of times. We have a small gun with us, and we have to learn how to use it effectively to defend ourselves. And that's going to include getting that thing drawn and on target quickly, getting that first shot off quickly, shooting most times instinctively rather than aiming, and all the things that I talked about in the book I was reading. So check them out. Now, if you're still with me, we're going to wrap up this part of the podcast. We'll start working on the second part in which I'm going to talk about the M1 Garand. Is the M1 Garand still a viable personal defense rifle in the 21st century? And how might we use the old techniques that were built around old weapons to make that rifle as effective as possible in today's world? We'll talk about that in the balance of the podcast, which is available on Patreon. If you're listening to the syndicated part, thank you very much for listening. Have a wonderful week, and wherever you go, whatever you do, please be safe. You've been listening to the Gun Guy TV podcast. 